So in today's lecture, we're going to pick up from uh, phase two of Bomb Lab and look at phase three and hopefully phase four as well. We'll get through the first four phases of Bomb Lab. And then what I'll probably do is I will hopefully have given you enough tools so that you could do the last phase on your own, phase five, so that I can migrate to Shell Lab starting uh, next lecture, uh, so starting next Monday because it's super important that we work our way all the way through Shell Lab before the semester ends. We're getting pretty close to the end of the semester. We're already, we're already in April. I think we have this month, and that's it. Is I think pretty much in the beginning of May, it's, it's over. So once we roll around that time, then we'll start talking about your presentations. Okay, so let's see, where did we leave off? Let me go, was it from here? 67. That's bomb, bomb one. Yes. Do I have, what's in? Did I update this document? So I think we got to, let's, let's do this. Let's go back and open up a permanent. Okay, let's see here. Let's take and... Um, piece dot. So I know that we got... Is it... You saw that TXT that we looked at? No. Yeah. No. That didn't look quite right. Let's take a look at um P soul or let's take Yeah, that's where. So it looks like these were the first two. So, uh, nope, we haven't found that either. So, this is the one we got. Let me just copy this. I don't even think that that is the. Uh, we have a lot of wrong solutions, example solutions on here. Cancel. Okay, so let's go in here. Where'd my terminal go? Getting some massive lag. Okay, let's have a little terminal. Do, do, do. Did not quite want to maximize that. Just want to drag. Okay, so let's do this. Let's touch PSOL, we'll call it 2.txt. Let's open it up. So based off of here, oh, we want based. Okay, so we know we want that. So that's where we last left off. Let's minimize this. Perfect. And then let's take a look at uh, And let's grab this. Copy. Close out of that. Get us that. Now let's see if we oh, get to phase three so we can start talking about a solution for that. Okay. Let's go up here. Open our terminal. Has anyone started to uh, do any of the bomb labs? Moving forward on it. Okay, let's see here. Last. Okay, so let's do, we'll do this very dangerously. We'll just go ahead and uh, 
run our bomb with pseudo.txt2, actually. Perfect. Okay. First two phases done. Let's control C F. Okay, so what we saw last time was we saw how to do phase one with strings, and we saw how to do phase one with the debugger, and then we saw how to use phase two with object dump, and we saw how to use phase two with the debugger. Is that correct? So moving forward, we're just going to rely strictly on the debugger to kind of explore what's happening inside of the bomb code, what's happening inside of the registers, so that we can we can evolve what our passcode is to eliminate each phase. So these next two phases are going to be a little bit more difficult than the prior, but we're going to use the same techniques that uh, we used earlier. It's just going to, we'll have to be a little bit more careful as we start parsing through all the code. And so you'll see what I mean in just a moment. So let's start by opening up our debugger, GDB, and let's load our bomb application. Okay, perfect. So the first thing I want to do is uh, let's disassemble phase three. And so the disassemble command allows us to go ahead and just do a, uh, a breakdown. So we can, we can look ahead of time before setting breakpoints, before trying to run anything, what is act, exactly defined inside that function. You see, this is a relatively large function. So we see we have our phase three here. And let's see, there's some interesting, so the interesting things that we have, we have our preamble stuff. Uh, we're moving zero into EAX. We're going to make a call to our scanner to scan our user input. And now we're going to compare our EAX to this value of one. And if it's greater than one, here, I'm looking at this right here. If it's greater than, uh, than one, then we're going to jump to this memory address here, which is going to be this one right here, which is going to avoid this explosion, this bomb explosion. So from right from the get-go, I can start to see where there's going to be a call to bomb explode in phase three. So moving forward, what we're going to want to do is as we start using the debugger, we want to start looking at all of the comparisons, all of the jumps, and whether it's going to allow us to avoid a invocation to explode bomb or if it's going to lead to an invocation to explode bombs. So let's actually kind of run this and kind of get an idea of what could be happening here. So let me, uh, so let's see here. Let's go back here. Let us, um, let's run our code. So let's see, that's P sold to, that's what I just made, dot txt. Let's run this. Okay, so now let's give some sample input. Let's start with just hello world because we don't have any real clue as to what it is yet. Oh, you know what? I should have set some breakpoints. <laughs> Important to set your breakpoints. Okay. So let's break on explode bomb. We don't want that. And in fact, let's also break on phase three because that's really what we're interested in. Okay, now let's run. Okay, so now let's try this again. Now let's uh, add in a prompt, hello world. Okay, so now we've broken on our function phase three. Inside of there, you can see we are starting to do all the preamble stuff. So we're making room onto our stack. Okay, let's do next on, because that's not so interesting to me. Yep, we're loading effective memory address into RCX. Let's 
next I load effective memory dress into R DX. We are moving this value into RSI. This is kind of an interesting thing. Let's see what this is. So what this looks like is it's starting to load values as parameters before calling the scanner function. But let's see what this particular value is here. Okay, so what I want to do is let's what's the memory address? Let's let's read. So if I want to read a value from memory, I can use the X command. So X slash and then the format that I want to read it in. I want to assume that it's going to be a string. So I'm going to do X slash S, and then I can feed it this memory address that I want to read from memory. So zero X four zero two. Seven, eight, A. Ah, okay. So what that looks like is it's providing a parameter to my scanner function call to parse the user input based off of these criteria. So it gives us a clue as to what the proper input should be in terms of at least data types. So it's expecting a percent D and a percent D. So two integer values. So clearly we already know this is likely not gonna work. Okay, so let me uh, do next time. And again, if I wanted to go ahead and uh, look at those two values, inside of my uh, register space, just so you can see how to do that. I can read from memory that same string, and then I can give it ESI because that's where we moved it. And it should give me the same thing after moving that in there. The only thing is if I go and read from memory, from a memory address, I use a dollar sign for that register space. Okay, so now let's see what happens here. Next I. So at this point, actually, it kind of allows us to peer in what's happening here. So inside a scanner, these are the registers that got filled, right? RDI is clearly the user input that we supplied that's from our input stream. Uh, our RSI, which was got loaded into RSI, is going to be the formatting instructions. And then the rest of this looks like it's probably uh, file path directories. And uh, let's see here, it's going to stop. And then let's see, let's do next I here. Okay, so after that call, now we're gonna compare EAX to one. And at this point, we know that this comparison is important because we need it to be greater than one in order to avoid this call to explode bomb. Everyone sees how there's an explode bomb here. So clearly this here, this jump will allow us to jump to 39, which would be here, which would avoid this call. Because typically we go sequentially from statement to statement. Okay, so at this point, we can go ahead and see what the value of our EAX is. So we can do that in a number of ways. We can go and just do a uh, print, um, let's see. And we can determine the data type. So if we print D, we could get the decimal value. And then I can do, uh, what is it? It's EAX we wanna look at. So dollar sign EAX. And so we have the value zero. I could also do X here for hexadecimal. Okay, so the question is, how can we get that? Now, let's see, we, we wanted to, we're comparing to one, but we need to be greater than one. So the question is, what is happening to EAX when we call the scanner function that sets it? Because it's, it's not being set directly in the code, but that's the thing we're comparing to after that function call. So there's a couple of ways we can determine this. Uh, one of these is we could just look at the man pages. We can read, right? 
the scanner function to see what is the return value for it. That's the way you probably should do this. But uh, let's let's test a theory out here. So we kind of peered into the belly of the beast to see that it's expecting a percent D space percent D. It's given us a set of constraints that it's trying to parse against. So I'm going to make an assumption that the number of valid occurrences that get parsed is what gets returned. So when we supply the scanner function in C, a set of wild cards that is trying to parse against, it's gonna let us know how many were valid. So it's a way of evaluating to see if the data types we've passed in is correct. But I'm gonna test this assumption. Let's go ahead and try, let's try this. Uh, okay. Let's try running our psol dot two txt again. And so now let's try a number. Let's say zero and hello. Okay. And now let's see, let's go to next i. Let's go to next i. Let's go to next i. Okay, so we're moving to ESI. So right now we're loading up all of the, we're moving EAX, we're moving uh, zero to EAX. We're calling that scanner function. And now we're comparing to EAX now. So now, Let's do the same thing we did moments ago. Let's take a look at the value of EAX if we did zero and hello. And we'd see, ah, it's not zero this time, it's one. We're still gonna lose though, because we gotta we jump if we're greater than one. Right now we're equal. That means that, well, we already kind of knew the, the, uh, the, the instructions, but that means that we should pass two uh, integer values. So let's do that. Let's do run p soul one dot txt oops nope uh, let's do two okay so now let's try hmm what numbers do we want to try for this what numbers do we want to try we know it's gonna be two numbers. But we don't know what numbers they are yet. That's all we know. Everyone understands how we got to the point knowing that we need two numbers though and how it checks against that for us. So now at this point, it could be any numbers. And recall that as you do this, you're gonna have different criteria for your bombs than what I have for mine. So, um, Let's see. Do you just want to do, well, let's not do zero, zero. You should do, when you debug, you should always use two different numbers so you know whether you're reading into the first param, the first argument or the second argument. But we need two integers. Let me see. Did anyone volunteer? Ah, we have some volunteers. Do 12. So we're going to do 12 as one number. What's the other? Negative five. Negative five. I like it. 12, oh no, don't lag on me now, computer. 12 and negative five, perfect. Okay, so please remember what order my numbers are. That's gonna be the responsibility of the class. What is my first argument? What is my second argument? We're gonna go ahead, go into that and let's take a look here. Let us go to next I, we're at next instruction, next instruction, all the preamble things, loading things up so that we can make our call to our scanner function to grab all of our user input. Okay, so now we can see what's getting passed. Kind of 
the nice thing about the debugger is it could let you, if you want, step into these uh, auxiliary helper functions and you can kind of trace the logic there. It even kind of gives you a, a quick view of what's being loaded in there as we already saw, but I'm just gonna continue on. Next I. Okay, so now we're comparing EAX to uh, one. Let's take a look at the value, it's two. So now we are greater than one, so we should jump and avoid the bomb. Next on. So here we can see it even tells me, let me stretch this out, that the jump was taken and the reason why. Then the next thing I'm gonna do, and now we're doing this other thing here where we're gonna compare a value that's currently on our on our stack. Remember that RSP is our stack pointer. We're going to um, take a look. So it's it's one of the values that were supplied by us. So recall that the stack pointer create some space when we call a function, and then it can populate things into the stack. We can actually inspect that. Uh, that's in memory, so let's take a look, x, and then let's try d, and then see if we can't do RSP. So use the register, and every time we use a register, we preface it with a dollar sign, and then we will do that offset, and let's verify this. Uh, we can't be converted into an integer. Okay, let's take a look at this. Uh, did the oh, we need to do a plus. There we go. So twelve, the value is twelve, which is makes sense, right? Isn't that what we put? So that's our first parameter. So now what we're doing is we're comparing the value twelve to the hexadecimal value of seven, right? So where 12 is what we gave it, argument one. And now we're going to do a jump above to the, this memory address, 151 at 151. So, uh, well, we're gonna see if that's just, I could disassemble and see what that is. I guess I could do that. We could, we can see where we're gonna jump to, or we can just do it, see if it was a good jump or not. Disassemble, what is this? This is phase three. Um, and so 151. Let's see what that is. 151. Oh, wait. That is probably not where we would want to jump to. And I think we're, we are going to jump to that, right? It was a jump above, and we did a 12, and we're comparing to seven. Oh, well, it's a good thing we set a break point. Okay, yeah, reason taken, because 12 is above seven. Well, uh, I don't I really don't need to do the next one. Yeah, okay, now we're definitely gonna call to explode that bomb. Okay, so now we've learned something. We've learned that the first argument has to be below seven, because it was jump A, right? Not jump above or equal to. So it's got to be below seven. Okay. So let's 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 do this again. Let's go back. Run. Uh, two. Dot txt. Okay. So what's a new number? We can't use twelve. I mean, we could use twelve, but we'll get stuck at the same spot. Five. So let's do five. And what do we use last time? Was it minus? Minus. Minus five. Okay, I like it. Five minus five. Okay, now let's do that same thing. Let's, I could set breakpoints and just go and continue, but I think there's a value to be had kind of stepping through all of the logic. You know, let's load our effective memory addresses into these so that we can make our call to our scanner.
Yep. Okay. Now let's go to the next instruction. Here we do our comparison. We should assume this is going to work because we've already seen that happen. Yes, we take that jump, which means we avoid exploding the bomb. Now we're going to compare again. And in this instance, we already know that five should be below seven, which means we won't take the jump, which is good because this jump kills us. So let's do next I, not taking, good sign. So now let's see where we go from here. So now we're gonna move into EAX, this value. And uh, what we can do is, and then we're gonna do a, a jump after that. Let's take a look at this value. Let's, let's actually take next I and just see what was put into EAX. Okay, so after doing that, we now know EAX has that value that was from our stack pointer. And I believe that's our first argument, just looking at that. Like we've inspected that already, haven't we? Stack pointer offset by uh, hexadecimal 14. I mean, not hexadecimal, yeah, uh, hexadecimal 1.4. So we can just take a look. Let's, we can print that out again. Okay, we can see that that is our value of five. That's inside of EAX. Okay, so what happens when we take this jump? Let's go next I. And what is this? This is going on RAX, multiplying, but it's taking a dereference at this location. Let's just jump into it and see what's happening. It's moving into EAX zero, okay. And then we're doing this jump again. And in fact, we can just verify, yeah, our value of EAX is zero. Okay. Let's walk. Okay, so now we're subtracting from EAX this value. Okay. So we haven't done that yet. Let's go next I, and now let's take a look. So now it's minus 349. Okay. And now we're add to EAX, I think that same values. We're just bringing it back to zero. And then it looks like we're subtracting from EAX again. So it looks like it's minus 349. <laughs> so it's like, we're just awesome. It was just like overriding EAX multiple times. And then we're gonna, go and jump right to 161, which is going to be right here. So we're going to jump and avoid this call to the bomb. That's good. So let's go to next I. Okay, so now we're doing this comparison where we're comparing that value and actually, let's take a look at that. Isn't that, our, I think that's our first argument. Um, let's take a look. Yeah, that's our first argument of five because we did five minus five, right? Okay, so here we're gonna compare five to five Looking good, maybe. And we're gonna jump if greater, oh, so we're only gonna jump if we're greater than five, we're actually five. Okay, and uh, let's see, where's where we jump into in this instance, 174. Oh, well, we don't wanna jump there. So that, that's good, good news. Okay, so let's uh, do next I, and it should tell us Jump not taken, we already know why. Let's do this again, next I. Here we're going to compare now EAX to, I have, 
I have a guess that since we're looking at the stack pointer at a different offset, that's going to be our second argument. But you know what? We can use the debugger to verify that. So let's take a look. Let's instead of doing RSP plus zero X one four, let's look at zero X one zero. So hexadecimal 10 and we can see, oh yes, that's our minus five. So now we're gonna compare whatever's in EAX. Oh, we did some really weird things with EAX, didn't we? We're like subtracting it and adding it and subtracting and adding it. What did it end up being? Probably not minus five though. Nothing is ever minus five. Okay, let's take a look at um, our value of, um, uh, let's we could use print D on our EAX. Oh. Um, dollar sign. Oh yeah, minus three forty nine. Okay, so that's okay. Let's let's see. We're gonna jump if equal. They're not equal, right? One's a minus five. The others are minus three forty nine. So in this instance, uh, so if they were equal, we would jump to one seventy nine, which would be right here. Oh, and the next line is to explode the bomb. So in this instance, we want them to be equal. Okay, so let's try this again. We don't have to step through that next instruction. We already know we're done for. So we'll do um, run psol2.txt. Perfect. And five and minus 349 was the second one. And here, in this instance, let's see something here. Uh, let's disassemble. Phase three. I want to get where we compare that. So here, I'm going to grab this, this address so that I can just jump right right there. So let's create a breakpoint. Break, put an asterisk if we're doing a direct memory address, not a label. And I'm gonna paste that here. And I'm gonna hit enter. Now I'm just gonna hit continue. And so now it should continue all the way until I get to that memory address. That way I don't have to keep hitting next I, next I, next I, next I. We've seen that enough times. So now we're at this comparison. Let's look at what our value is. So that is minus 293, wait, minus 93. That's okay. So let me take a look at what's in EAX. Oh, oh, okay. Let's take a look at what's inside of EAX. Print D EAX minus 349. Ooh, ooh, that's gonna be, that's gonna be kind of interesting. Well, let us, uh, See then, next I, and uh, yeah, that's not going to, reason taken, next I. So we avoided the bomb. So I was probably looking at the number in a, uh, not as a sign number. So it was just giving it to me in an unsigned format. And so here, that means, well, if that, if I didn't explode, that means I should just be able to continue out and get halfway there. Excellent. Okay, so one of those things when working with sign numbers, we now know, keep that in mind when you're inspecting your memory address. 
Okay, so uh, what do we have? Let's let's quit out of this. Let's quit out of this. So that means we're past phase three. Now, did everyone see? We didn't even really understand what the logic was on what was happening in the function. We can derive the answer just by inspecting the registers and inspecting the compares and seeing what is constantly comparing to that leads to the explosion of the bomb. That is a valid way of doing this lab. In fact, that's what this lab is really trying to train you to do, how to constantly step through code and kind of break it down and uh, see what is the state of your registers at any given time that leads towards a function call. In this instance, a function call you don't want to occur. Now in the next phase, it's gonna get a little bit more complicated where you're gonna need a little bit of an intuition to understand what leads the bomb to explode or not. So this one's a, a fun one, a little bit more complicated than phase two, but ultimately it should be something that's pretty much doable, right? You just, you keep checking to see what's causing the comparisons to occur. Okay, let me update. So we used, uh, what, it was five and uh, minus 349. So let's see here. Do I have one of those? P soul three dot txt. Um, no, that's clearly wrong. But I will update this one. Let's update this one. So P soul three. Let's close that. So let's just open this. P soul three dot txt. And what did we say it was? It was five and minus 349. Okay. And then we have perfect. So let's write that. Okay. So now let's cat pso3.txt. Perfect. Okay. Now let's be very, I, I'm allowed to be very risky because I'm not gonna award myself any points for this. So let's just give it psol3.txt and perfect. Phase one, phase two, phase three is now complete. So now let's go ahead and take a look at how we can go ahead and try to find a solution for phase four. The, now remember, there's technically six phases to bomb lab. You only have to do five for full credit. Right, the sixth phase is a bonus phase. It gives you more points than you need, and I guess splashes over for your other grades then. Okay, let's go ahead and control C. Okay, let's clear out of this. Okay, so before we move on to phase four, does anyone have any questions about phase three, about what I did? Okay, so just so it gets recorded, looking at some of the feedback on from online, can't we use seven? Seven is not above seven. I would do that value before trying anything else. Uh, you diffuse phase three. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Well, do you have a, a question in particular as to why phase three got diffused? And is everyone in class pretty much? I know I'm looking at the text on the debugger and I know where I'm looking. So I, sometimes I forget that you might not be looking at exactly the same line I'm looking at while I'm talking about things. So if at any time you're like, wait, how did you know this was a thing? Just let me know and I'll step back. It's easy enough for the debugger to repeat the process. But the big takeaways here is that we can set breakpoints. We can disassemble by function name. Disassembling by function name allows us to read through the code, but not only read through the code, but also get our memory addresses that correspond to each instruction so that we can set breakpoints based off of memory address and not necessarily by label. 
and that we can print values from memory using X, and we can just print register spaces using the print commands. Uh, and also we can step through using next I for next instruction. Okay, so now let's do this. Okay, let's uh, open up our debugger again. Uh, G D B. Let's uh, load into our debug. No, what is going on? Why is it doing that? <laughs> okay. Um. Let's uh, close that terminal. <laughs> Doctor Evil's bomb is like getting frustrated that we're getting closer to diffusing it, and is like stealing the input stream. <laughs> from guacamole. <laughs> yeah, you can use info registers as well, and then just EAX. That is, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, I mean. <laughs> um, how did my, did my beep? Key just gets stuck in the middle of lecture. Okay, let's try this. It's going to be really hard for me to avoid the B key if I'm having issues with it for Bomb Lab, considering that I have to use it at least twice for the application name. I have at least once for the debugger. G, D, B. Okay, perfect. Okay, so the first thing, let me not forget to set my breakpoints. Break, nope, break, explode bomb, break for phase four, okay. Looking good so far. Okay. Now the first thing we can do is, it's always kind of a good idea before we even start running anything, we can just disassemble and examine what phase four looks like. So here we have phase four. By the way, you can do this with any of the helper functions as well. So while you're doing this, if you see there's a call to helper function, you're like, what's happening there? Just disassemble, and if it has a label, use the label. Um, otherwise, you can use the memory address. So if I do this, notice here, it gives me the set of memory addresses. Here in this next column, it gives me the offset from the label, which is phase four. So for instance, this is 74 bytes or offset from our uh, memory address at phase four. And uh, here is each of the instructions that are encoded. Okay, um, can I stretch this out a little bit more? Kind of, no. Slowly come up. Okay, and let me drag this down. Oh, this is not that large of a function actually. So just taking a quick gander at it, um, before walking through, and again, we'll walk through and really evaluate what's happening. But we can see uh, the first thing we're doing is we're padding our uh, our red our stack. So we can see, which is usually what we do when we invoke a function. We're gonna go ahead and create some stack space on there. Then we're gonna load into uh, effective address into RCX and RDX. It looks like probably, if I, I had to guess, the values that we have supplied, right? So, um, which we haven't supplied any values, but I'm assuming now, just an assumption, it's looking for two sets of values from us. Just based off of what the last function looked like and the fact that we were accessing 
based off of uh, stack pointer offsets. But when we start to play around with our code and stepping through the instructions, we're going to verify some of our uh, assumptions here. So I guess this, that's a good strategy. You disassemble, you try to understand what's happening, and then you test to see if your understanding matches to the state of the code base and the state of the registers at each step. And then we're gonna move into ESI, this uh, value inside of memory. I'm assuming that this is gonna be the set of constraints we're parsing against. This very much looks the same as the last function where we're loading all of the, uh, all of the parameters, all the arguments as parameters to a call to our scanner. Okay, so yeah, and then we're gonna move into EAX, the value of zero. Well, we know the call to the scanner object's going to deposit something into our accumulator register, which is gonna be the number of valid values that were parsed based off of our constraint. So this is now starting to generate a pattern for us. So we recognize these sets of instructions from the last phase, they're repeated in this phase, and so before even testing it, we can kind of understand what it's going to look for. So does everyone see how this kind of looks similar to the last phase? OK, then what are we doing? Then we're going to make this call to scanner here. And then we're going to compare. Ah, this is the same comparison, just in a different way. Last time, we jumped if greater than 1 which meant that we have to have two valid numbers. Here, we're going to compare to see if it's two. So now we're going to have an equality operator, probably. Yeah. So, oh, actually, a jump if not equal. Jump if not equal. And then we jump to 47. Oh, there we go. So that's going to blow us up. So that lets us know we have to have two a value of two inside of our EAX register if we are not to explode. And that's probably gonna be, if I had to guess, numbers. But we can test that out. And let's do that. Let's take a moment and inspect what's happening here. So let's uh, um, run. PSOL3.txt. I set my breakpoints, right? I think I did. Okay. Okay, so do we just want to use numbers at this point since we're making that assumption? What numbers do we want to use? Let's assume that it's going to be similar since we're comparing to two, that it's going to look for two numbers. Don't know if that's true, but it's a starting point. Uh, what two numbers do we want to start with then? And let me make sure if there's any suggestions or questions here. Pull it off and put it back on. Looks very similar to phase three. Yeah, it does. Okay. Any recommendations for numbers? Like the class enthusiasm is like, we don't care. <laughs> um, any number. Okay, let's do uh, seven, five. Does that sound fine? Okay, so we'll do seven five. We'll supply that in. We're going to now remember what I've been looking at. If you haven't, if you've been kind of lost while I've been stepping in the debugger, the active instruction is this green one, the one that has the arrow pointing to it. And by the way, let me also show you this. If I uh, disassemble and then do use like phase four. Right, the active instruction is the one with the arrow next to it. So at any time while I'm stepping through the application of my debugger, I can kind of expand out to see all the instructions in the memory addresses that are associated and still shows me where I'm currently at in the execution process. Okay, so now let's do next I. 
Okay, so now load it up back to memory address. Uh oh. Let's do the same. Next I. Let's move this value. Oh, you know what? Let's look at that memory address. Uh, let's assume it's a string and uh, zero X four O two seven eight A. And oh yeah, look at that. It is exactly the same set of constraints. Now at this point, if I would have guessed just because of phase three, that was two numbers. I went with phase, I, I went with uh, two numbers here and then all of a sudden it was percent D, percent D, percent D. I know, oh, it's gotta be three numbers then. I would definitely know if it's supposed to be three numbers based on the comparison. I kind of, the guess was based off of what it was comparing to after I made a call to scan the scanner function though, right? Because I knew what it returns against. Okay. Okay, so the next instruction here is I'm gonna move zero into my EAX. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm gonna call this uh, scan function. And then I'm gonna compare to see if my accumulator space has a value of two. So did I actually parse two numbers? And I did not take that jump, which is great, because that one led to a bomb explosion, if you recall. And now we're gonna move into EAX, this value inside of our register space. So let's go ahead and see what the value of that is going to be. So let's print D um, EAX. So that's seven, that's our first parameter, right? So that is good. So then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna test EAX to EAX. Does everyone know what that does? So it allows us, okay. So then, then because the next thing that's gonna happen after that is it's going to do this JS. And so this is gonna be a jump to call to explode the bomb. Okay, so what is JS? That's right, jump sign. So if my sign bit is toggled, then that means I'm gonna jump to this address. And what's inside of EAX right now is my first argument, right? That now lets me know that my first argument can't be a negative value. Because if it was, I would make a jump to explode the bomb, at the, uh, the, the bomb at this point. So I got lucky. I luckily guessed a number that did not trigger a bomb explosion. So, but I have to remember that for next time. Because the, the assumption is that just because I evaded one bomb explosion doesn't mean I probably am going to evade all of them. But now I know another criteria that will cause the bomb to explode the next time I go for my next attempt. Okay. We will um, stop, stop. Okay, we will kill this terminal. <sighs> okay. What is going on here? Man, the further we get through these phases, the more Dr. Evil is interfering with my guacamole instance. <laughs> it's like Frogger. 
It's like, get to the terminal. Get to the terminal. Okay, well. So this is what we'll do. Let's uh let's see if I can't just refresh our connection to guacamole. Okay. Okay, let's go into the bomb lab. Let's go to open a terminal. Okay, let's do this again. Uh, GDB bomb. And okay, now let's go ahead and well, let's uh, let's break set our breakpoints. Break on explode bomb. Break on phase four. And let us, uh, let's go ahead and then run on psol.3.txt. Okay, perfect. Now we said uh, it was seven, five that we did before. And let us go to, Okay, so let's jump through this again. Okay, let's see. Let's go through that. Okay, so yeah. Come on. I'm in the explode bomb function. No. no let's let's do that again. Seven five. And that, let's actually pay attention as we step through. So we're loading all of our necessary things into all of our parameters to make a function called to scanner. Then we're going to compare EAX to two, which that jump is not taken. And then we're going to move our first parameter into EAX. And we're testing that, which is going to help us evaluate the sign bit. And then we're going to jump based off the sign bit, which is not taken. And then the next thing we do is we're not going to compare EAX to 14. Okay. So at this point, or, or hexadecimal value E. Right, so at this point, and at, inside of EAX at this point, we can say print X uh, EAX, it's seven. Okay, so we're comparing seven to 14 or hexadecimal E, and we're gonna jump if less or equal to 52, which is right here, which is perfect because if we don't jump, we're gonna explode. So first of all, our first parameter has to be a number. It can't be negative. And now it has to be 14 or less. So far, we've gotten really lucky. We've avoided three bomb explosions by picking well. OK. So let's do next. And it shows me it was taken. Next I. Okay, so now we're going to move into EDI, the value that's at RSP, our stack, offset by 0x14. That's our first argument, right? I'm pretty sure it is. At any time, I can just take a look. Let's take a look at it. Um, What was it? It was RSP offset by 0x14. Yeah, seven, right? That's our first argument. So we're taking the value of seven, we're loading into EDI, we're taking the value of uh, hexadecimal E, that's 14, and loading that to EDX, and we're taking the value of zero and loading that into ESI. Oh, uh, you know what we're doing? 
we're loading a set of parameters just like we were before for the scanner function. But in this instance, we're loading a set of parameters that are now going to get called for function four. Func four. And then after we call this function, presumably something's going to happen to EAX. Like I'm assuming something happens to EAX because look up here, we compared EAX here to the value. What, what was in EAX before? Wasn't EAX our uh, first argument? And then we did this comparison here to 14. Okay, so presumably at some point EAX is gonna change because we're gonna compare it to the value of one and we will jump if not equal at that point. And I don't know yet if that jump's gonna be good or bad. I'm assuming it's gonna be good, but don't know yet, but let's step through. Okay, so let's do next I. Okay, so we're loading. So at this point an EDI should be our first argument. Uh, okay, let me do this last one and it should display. Yeah, here we go. So the nice thing is it actually shows me the arguments that are all passed in that are used inside of function four. So notice RDI is my value of seven. That's my first argument. RSI is the value of zero which was defined right here, right? Here, I'll highlight. Uh, RDX is the value of 14 hexadecimal E, which was assigned right here, right? So these are all the parameters that were passed into func four. And then RCX is the value of zero. So RCX is presumably used inside this function. Okay, so now let's do next i. We're going to ignore what function four does at this point just to see what it gives back to us. My suspicion is we're going to have to peer into the box of function four and kind of see what it's doing to return a value back. Because this is the first time we're encountering something where it looks like it's not going to be a direct mechanism for us just to see what the comparison for the explode bomb is. It's, it's going to be an indirect uh, decision. Okay, so now we're going to compare EAX to uh, the value of one. So why don't we print out what the value of EAX is actually. So let's do um, EAX zero. Okay, so we got back a value of zero. That can't be good. Uh, okay, so we're comparing zero then to one, and we're gonna jump if not equal to 83, which is an exchange on AX and AX, but then leads it immediately after that to an explode ball. So the initial jump, is not awful, but when you look at the next line, you're like, okay, that's not good. We definitely, it looks like what we're gonna wanna do is uh, not take this jump, do this other comparison, and then jump to the thing that's after this explode bomb, which is gonna be 90, which is gonna be after 85. So this is one of the jumps we don't wanna take. Okay, well, let's see what's happening then with um, what was the that that function called func four. So what I can do is I can disassemble func four, and again, just like whenever I do a disassembly instruction, it's going to give me the set of memory addresses, and it's going to give me a set of um. It'll give me the set of offsets from my label, and then finally my set of instructions. So what I have here is quite interesting. What I have here is uh, 
I'm moving EDX into ECX. I'm moving ESI. I'm going to subtract from ESI EDX. I'm going to move EDX into EAX. And I'm going to start doing some shifting. So I'm doing a lot of operations on these parameters that are passed in. Um, what's interesting, though, is this. Look at this particular line. There's a call to invoke the function we're already in. This lets me know that this might be a recur. Well, this is a recursive function because it calls itself. Okay, let's see. We have a couple, but the things that I look at immediately are going to be these things, these uh, comparisons. And so all of these comparisons are inside of our function. So they're probably going to be either selection statements or loop structures, right? Depending on how we're jumping about. So we're comparing EAX and EDI, and then we're jumping based off of if it's less than or equal. We are then loading this value here and then calling this function. If based off of whether we make that jump or not, we make this jump here. Here we jump if greater than or equal. And then finally we have our return back out. So we have uh, how many compares? One, two, we have two compares for the most part. Okay. So for a function like this, it makes it a little bit more, I mean, oh, I guess we could potentially step through this one, but I don't really have the time to. Uh, and we could kind of debug to see what the solutions are. Uh, some of the interesting things we have though is turn EAX. We have some pretty interesting things happening here. And here. So here, we're loading some values that's rax plus rax times one and rax plus rax times one plus one. So it's kind of like multiplying the value of rax by two, but either way, we're then going to move that value to eax. And that's how we're, that's how EAX is getting overwritten. So does everyone see where EAX is getting its value from now? It's either here. So EDX is either set here or here. And it's probably a selection statement of some sort. Okay, let's let's see if we can't take a look at what is actually happening inside these lines. So if you wanted to solve this, the best way to do that would be to do a per line instruction on each of the uh, assembly lines. So let's see if all of these make sense. And if, uh, we'll start with that. I might finish off with this one next week if I don't have enough time because I have two minutes left. So let's see if I can at least make sure everyone understands what's happening with these lines. Okay, so we're moving the value from EDX into ECX. We're gonna subtract from ESI, uh, I'm sorry, we're gonna subtract ESI from EDX and store that result into EDX. Remember this is always the source and the, um, uh, the source and the target. Uh, we're going to move the value from EDX into EAX. We're going to do a logical shift, write the value. It's by 31 bits. Here, we're going to add EDX to EAX and store the result in EAX. We're going to do a arithmetic shift right uh, to the right by one bit. Here, we're going to add ESI to EAX and store the result in EAX. We're going to compare the values of EAX and EDI. We're going to jump if EAX is less than EDI. Then we're going to load that value into EDX. 
whatever that value ends up being, and then call a recursive function to uh, func4. If we don't do that, this loads the address of RAX, and so I'm assuming we get there via jump. This is going to jump to 55, which would be down here, where we move EDX into EAX and return out. So that is an exit condition. Here, this sets our, uh, we move zero into EDX. We compare the values of EAX to EDI. We jump if greater to 55, which is looks like our exit condition. Here, we would load the address value into ESI, move the value from ECX to EDX, and do another re recursive function call. Okay. Just to try to make this into a little less trees and more forest to try to identify what, how does this logic interplay together, let me leave you off with this re-expression, and then we'll pick back up next lecture. If I wanted to take those same sets of instructions as I have them here, but re-express them in a C code function, func4, I'm going to recall that when we were looking at the instructions, it used three parameters. And so I'm gonna use the same register names as my parameters of EDI, which was our parameter, ESI, which was zero, and EDX, which was 14. Then what we can see, what is really happening is ECX is given the value of EDX, which represents the max value. What we're gonna see is all of these things come together to effectively implement a binary search and return a value based off of binary search. So that means in the binary search, uh, we're gonna set our, ma our max value, which can change over the course of it to ECX. So it's gonna start at 14, the max value possible. And so then the difference between ESI, which is the minimal value, the value of zero, and the maximal value is the number of units that can span your binary search. So that's what's being set inside of EDX. And then we're just gonna take EDX and save that into EAX because that's gonna be the thing that gets manipulated in order to find the halfway point. So what we're doing is we're doing this shift to get a one, we're gonna add that one to the value of, uh, uh, to the value before we do the arithmetic shift to get the halfway point because of the complement. Remember our two's complement means it's when we do our division, we have to take into account that, that, that concept. So we have to add one before we right shift to have our space from whatever the max value is to the middle point. So the middle point is the, the halfway point, which we can do with a simple shift by one bit. So that this is effectively performing the computation to find the middle point. And then what we're gonna do is just do a comparison to say, if this is a middle point, you return out. If it's greater, you do this one computation. If it's less than, you do this other computation, uh, computation and then you return out a value. Now the trick is, what is the value it returns out? Because you know that the condition that you need to supply is a value that gets passed to this function that results in EAX being one. So I'm gonna leave it up to that point with you here, and we're gonna see what conditions allow that to be true for next class. Does that, um, does that much information make sense so far? And so this is gonna be the trick with some of these problems where it would behoove you to kind of disassemble it, find the line by lines, but then find how they interconnect to create a logic. And then you can test it out, right? Because if you got it right, you can pass the value in and then it lets you pass that part of the, uh, the instructions. Okay, I've, I've kept you too long. We will pick back up next lecture.